Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a new episode of Unlock People's Potential. Honestly, I'm so excited about today's episode. My guest is Genevieve Bell. Genevieve Bell is an anthropologist and vice president of the Corporate Strategy Office at Intel. As an anthropologist, her job description is pretty straightforward. Genevieve Bell has to think about how technology will change how human beings behave. So together, we covered a lot of topics. We mostly talked about what anthropology can bring to technology companies, how you can hire an anthropologist, and what the future will look like. So without further ado, enjoy today's episode. Hello, Genevieve. Hello. I'm very happy to have you uh, on Unlock People's Potential. And I actually wanted to start right now. So you're an anthropologist. I am an anthropologist. I have a PhD in cultural anthropology from Stanford University, but I'm also the child of an anthropologist. So I grew up on my mother's field sites in central and northern Australia in the 1970s and 1980s. So I sometimes joke that I have degrees in anthropology, but I have a life in anthropology too. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds impressive. And like I think most of our listeners are actually not that familiar uh, about what anthropology is. Maybe you can tell us a bit more about what is anthropology? Of course. So there are lots of different kinds of anthropology, depending if your listeners are in Britain or the United States or in Europe. There are very different branches of anthropology. Um, but usually it's central a sort of idea is about the study of human beings and their culture and their cultural patterns. Uh, one of the very sort of famous American anthropologists of the 20th century, a man named Clifford Geertz, used to say that, you know, basically culture, the thing that anthropology study was uh, something to the effect of the webs of significance and meaning in which we are all suspended. So he would say that, you know, anthropology was about the studies of patterns of culture and about how we make meaning in our lives. If you were raised in British anthropology, you'd think it was also about social organization and kinship and how we structure our relationships with other people. If you were in the United States, you'd say it would also include human prehistory and linguistics and archaeology. If you were in other places, you might think it's about society and culture. So lots of different things. But for me, fundamentally, anthropology is about the study of people and culture. And anthropology is mostly done and like, People who work in anthropology mostly work at universities in academia. And you work at Intel. Why does a, a technology company need anthropologists? Well, actually, I need to kind of uh, just even sort of question that basic fact, as it turns out. Um, the history of anthropology is a history of a discipline that's had a lot of different locations. The first anthropologists all actually were for government and government organizations, academic departments. Uh, in the US working on Native American issues in particular. Um, we've had a move to have academic anthropology departments and you know there are long and venerable traditions of that, but about 70% of people who graduate with advanced degrees in anthropology don't actually end up in teaching jobs in academic anthropology departments. They end up in a lot of other places, in NGOs, in nonprofits, in government work, in industry, and in other academic departments in universities. So, met an anthropologist two days ago who was in a geography and an urban planning department. So we, we, we get around. Uh, in industry, there's been a long tradition of it, both in Europe and Australia and the US. Um, the first anthropologist ended up in industry here in the 1920s and 30s. So I'm part of a kind of a long wave of it. Now that's all a very long wind up. Um, how did I end up at Intel, which is usually a better question. I'm at a bar. Oh, Australian story. At that point, I knew there had been anthropologists who had worked in companies, but I didn't realize there were uh, sort of room for them in the tech industry. And, you know, 1990s was a big kind of internet build up, the first one, the dot com kind of moment. And, you know, a number of companies were starting to think about how to approach innovation and new technology development differently. So they wanted to add new ways of thinking about what technology could do. And that meant new ways of thinking about what were the challenges and aspirations and problems that technology was trying to address. So at Intel, ended up looking at 
psychology, sociology, and anthropology for people who would bring a different point of view. And, you know, when I joined Intel, it was a, a rarer thing to be a social scientist in a tech company. These days, pretty much every technology company I can think of is an anthropologist. And, you know, some psychologists and occasional economists, a couple of them have philosophers, and they were really kind of branched out in the last sort of 20 plus years. And so your your work is mostly about thinking about the future and how people will behave in the future. And in practice, what does it mean? Like, what are the what does a typical project look like? Yeah. So my job is um kind of uh my job has evolved over the time, and I don't really know how to say it. I have had a slightly different job than I had two years ago. So two years ago, I was running an advanced research and development lab that was really about spending time with people in their daily lives, getting a sense of what made them tick, looking at what they were doing, and then thinking about where might new technology sit inside those lives and then prototyping them and testing them, which was kind of, you know, really cool. These days I get an equally cool but slightly different job. So these days I'm in our corporate strategy office and my job is to think actually quite explicitly about the future um, and explicitly so, but with an idea to how you put together the stories we tell ourselves about the future of technology with the stories we tell ourselves about the future of society and culture, as well as government regulation and policy and public policy and standards, as well as the things we do as human beings that will bring with us into that future. So I'm confident about what will the, the world look like over the next decade or so. And, you know, that's an interesting place to be an anthropologist because I often think in anthropology, I'm very much grounded and rooted in the present. You know, most of the way we do our research as anthropologists, spending time with people, getting a sense of what makes them tick and how they, you know, think about their world. Those are very present-based activities. Um, but I think the thing I bring into those conversations in the tech world is that the thing about human beings is, while on the surface it appears that everything is changing and we are beset with the sense that everything is speeding up and it's much more complicated than it used to be, the reality is many of the things we care about as human beings have remained unchanged for a remarkably long time, and we bring those deep-seated impulses with us to new technologies. And so while you can spend a lot of time talking about the future, it turns out the future will have a tremendous amount in common with the present because we will be living in both of them. And, and as your work focusing on strategy, you look at the big picture. How do you translate that into a, a like daily strategy? Because you think about what is going to happen, but then how do you translate that into the present? <laughs> Gosh, that's such a good question. <laughs> With a lot of difficulty sometimes. <laughs> Part of what I end up doing in my day job these days is helping people think about the fact that the future won't be singular. There are lots of different ways the future might unfold. And so part of what I try to do in my, my daily work at the moment is very much about people come with ideas about new technologies and I help lead conversations with them about, okay, what needs to be true in the world for that technology to be successful? What are you assuming about human behavior, government regulations, cultural patterns that might not be true? So how do we ask some harder questions about the underlying assumptions in technology? How do we ensure that we are doing the right research around those questions to make sure that we're not taking someone's deeply idealized vision of the way the world works and building technology to that. So part of my job is, you know, as cultural critic, part of it's about reminding people that technology ultimately needs to be in someone's hands, so we should, we should be thinking about those early. All of which means that much of the day job looks incredibly boring on paper. It's just a lot of meetings, a lot of conversation. The reality of every single one of those conversations is an opportunity to make the world different Now, I think in some ways that looks quite different from my academic anthropology colleagues who are in some ways also engaging in those conversations, but they're engaging in those conversations in classrooms and in academic papers. But ultimately, you know, the business of being an anthropologist and the professional life of it is usually as someone who asks questions. And as some of my colleagues like to remind me, questions that no one can really answer easily. <laughs> and where, where do you get this insight? Uh on the future, do you still work with the research team that kind of provide you the information that you need? Um, I try to get and glean insights about the future from a number of places. I'm lucky enough to have 
a number of wonderful colleagues at Intel who are research social scientists to spend time in the field still and spend time with people, getting a sense of, you know, what makes them tick and spending time in their homes and places of business and meaning making in their lives. So I still see all that material. I sometimes get to go do a little bit of field work myself. So there's sort of that piece. We have access to large bodies of quantitative data, so data sets that, you know, will often tell you the what of people are doing, but really the why of what people are doing. One of the things about most technology development is that it's slower than Hollywood would have you believe. So I also get to see what's being built in the lab, and that will often give you an insight to where technology is going. Um, I spend a lot of time talking to technologists to tell me about things. On the government and regulatory side, I spend a lot of time reading government policy and position papers and talking to people who write legislation and are thinking about legislation. And I follow the news in those spaces. And, you know, I continue to read and research in the cultural and historical spaces to make sure that I'm threading things together. And then, you know, we try and add new and different methodologies into all of these things. So I think if you want to spend your time thinking about the future, you also have to know a bit about the past because many things have historical antecedents that are important. I think you also need to pay attention to the what's called the socio-technical imagination, so the landscape in which we invent the future. Think of that as being Hollywood, science fiction, movies, where we've kind of, you know, created these stories about what the future would look like. And those often shape the reality of how we build technology. I mean, there is a well-established set of connections between the look and feel of the first mobile phones that came out of Asia and the images of technology in Star Trek, for instance. So our imagination of what the technology should look like are often tied up with things beyond technology itself, you know, culture, the imagination, science fiction. And so I think you need to kind of be paying attention to all of those things. So really all that, what that also means is that I don't really sleep a lot and I don't take vacation. <laughs> I spend a lot of time just paying attention to the whole world constantly. I think it makes me a very bad dinner companion. <laughs> <laughs> and so, Genevieve, I had a question because there are a lot of companies that have research branches and that also have like marketers working daily with customers to make sure that they have some good insights um, from them. But then it seems sometimes that this knowledge is kind of stuck within the marketing department or like even within the research branch. How do you make sure that the knowledge that you have is shared uh, within Intel? Ah, uh, yeah. So I think one of the interesting things is all the locations you find anthropologists and research social scientists, right? You're absolutely right. Some of them are in marketing departments, but you know there are other researchers in product divisions and business units and in advanced R&D, which is where I spend a lot of my time strategy office, which is where I now am. So I think one of the challenges that lots of companies have, and you're absolutely right, is that information is siloed. Um, I don't think that's a, a challenge just for research social scientists, right? I think one of the things that is increasingly clear in bigger, older companies, but also newer startups, is how you make sure that information flows and that so do insights and that we don't get kind of stuck in the notion of, well, that work was done over here and so it should stay over there. And I think, you know, one of the interesting things we see lots of companies facing is how you break down those silos. Uh, for me, when I was running my last lab, I was really explicit in staffing it with people who had very different backgrounds. So I had a team of research social scientists, but I also had a team of designers and a team of technology researchers. And I didn't think of those as individual teams. In fact, when I put together project teams, I deliberately pulled them from across each one of those kind of competencies because I wanted ways for people to talk to one another. Of course, the reality in all of this is that knowledge is still power. Information is still a resource. So there are reasons why people don't always share it, right? It's because it gives them it gives them something that they can hold on to as their own. And I think, you know, sometimes It's not even that simple. It's uh, what one person knows, someone else doesn't know how to listen to as information. So when I first came to Intel, I mean, nearly 20 years ago, and it's not true anymore, but certainly when I got there, people were so used to quantitative data, they didn't know how to make sense of qualitative data. So they dismissed it out of hand. They'd say, well, you didn't talk to 10,000 people, then you know nothing. <laughs> it's really <laughs> interesting process. We have to go through to educate around the company about the fact that qualitative research was also really good. It pointed you in a different direction and you needed to evaluate it differently. 
but frequently, you know, quantitative research, yes, it was much smaller scale, usually much more sanitized, much less, quote unquote, random sampling. But that what it was, was it was directional, it was speculative, it let you open up a conversational space and it was really good for sparking new ideas, you know. And if you want to answer the question of, you know, how much should we charge for this? Qualitative research may not be as good as quant. And I think, you know, part of what we needed to do in the kind of my early work at Intel, and I, this is true for my colleagues in other places too, was to get people better at even recognizing there was information they didn't have. You know, sometimes what happens is people just dismiss it, not because it's in a different group or because it's hived off or silent, because they don't even know how to make sense of it. And I think part of the responsibility of all of us who bring different disciplinary backgrounds to bear in these places is how do we help other people make sense of what we do? And how do we give them ways into the material and its insights? And that requires real work. Genevieve, I'm sure you already have convinced um, most of our listeners that anthropology is something that they should look at. <laughs> <laughs> and like, if, if there is a team that actually wants to hire an anthropologist or build a research team, what, what would we recommend? What are the criteria to hire good anthropologists? Oh, also, really good questions. I think it's different in different places. Um, and unlike applying for an academic job where it might be in an anthropology department where it is clear that having a PhD in anthropology or a master's degree is the right thing, frequently the jobs that are listed beyond the academy uh, are not going to be that specific. So you actually have to learn to read those job openings in a different way. So you're looking for things that are around user experience, user research, advanced research and development, ideas around participatory design and interaction design. And usually what people are looking for is a couple of things, right? One is a track record as a researcher, an ability to communicate. And I will have to say, for me at least, the, one of the hardest moves in moving from being an academic anthropologist to my current set of roles was learning how to communicate to people who weren't anthropologists. We have such a disciplinary shorthand and we're so used to talking to people who've read all the same things we have that we forget all the leaps of logic that we make in conversations. And for me, the practice of having to talk to people who were not anthropologists, the first year was quite exhausting. Oh, my God, it was really painful. And after that, I realized it made me a much better scholar and researcher because I knew where the leaps of logic I had made were and I learned to be more critical of them and I learned how to communicate better to people who didn't share my disciplinary practices. All of this is to say that if someone is looking to hire, they may not care what your area of expertise is in anthropology. They may not care the fine granularity of the theoretical precepts that you use to do your work. What they will care about is that you know how to communicate that to people beyond your discipline that you are willing to work in teams, which isn't always an anthropological thing. Archaeology, yes. Cultural anthropology, less so. So how do you demonstrate an orientation to team to teamwork and to working in interdisciplinary teams? Much more interdisciplinary than you would ever encounter at a university. And I think part of the challenge on all that is how do you learn to talk about the value you bring in a different kind of language? If you were looking for a job beyond academic anthropology, There's a little bit of work you need to do to make yourself comprehensible and, you know, uh, yeah, comprehensible and legible to these other audiences. Now, the good news is that's not such a hard work. And the better news is there are lots of places that are already working on this. So there are a couple of academic industry conferences that happen, things like EPIC, so Ethnographic Praxis in Industry, which has a great website and a really good jobs posting board. There are lots of listservs around. Anthro Research, Yahoo is one of them that I can think of. There are other academic conferences that increasingly are also aware that practitioners in anthropology have jobs beyond the academy, looking at the Society for Applied Anthropology, as well as a couple of other places. So it's out there if you know how to go looking for it. And Genevieve, going, going back to your work in research, uh, so what, what, what you mentioned about like the criteria is like you need to do and to have a good track record of research. Um, how did you do that to prove that you were able to be a good um, researcher at Intel? <laughs> yeah, well, truthfully, when I was hired, Intel didn't know what they were looking for. 
Um, because I'm sure if they had, they might not have hired me. I mean, frankly, when I go back 18 years and think that I, my background was in Native American ethno history and feminist theory. <laughs> I mean, at one level, those are not obvious things that you would land in a tech company, right? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Happily, they were... No, not really. They were more happy about the contents of my skull, like you know, my capacity to think and the ways I could think and the specifics of the work I had done. These days, you'd probably be thinking, what if people publish? Where have they published it? What kind of papers have they given? And frankly, how do they talk about the work they have done? So, you know, I don't, you know, I'm not sure I do know what it looks like. Um, for many of us, when we applied for academic jobs, back in the dark ages and now, one of the ways you, you do that is to read a paper out loud. Well, it turns out in many places in industry, that's not going to get you a job. So do you know how to talk about your work without reading the words out loud? So, you know, how do you know how to talk about what you do to make it accessible to different audiences? You don't have to have done work necessarily that was relevant to industry, but you need to give people a way into what it is you want to do. And my suspicion is in different places, those track records look different and how the assessed looks different too. So besides being a good researcher, you need to be a good uh, public speaker as well. Yeah. And I think you need to be willing to be someone who works in teams and works interdisciplinary and is willing to, I don't know, tackle problems beyond your immediate domain. I have a question, Genevieve, about your research. Um, so sometimes ethnography requires you to do weird things. Um, what is the least probable thing that you have to do uh, in your research? What is the least probable thing you've had to do? Yes, like oh. the, the weirdest one. Um, <laughs> so I started this by saying I'm the daughter of an anthropologist. I was seven years old when my mother took my brother and I to Central Australia and we lived with indigenous people who could remember their country before Europeans and who spent a great deal of time taking my brother and I onto their country with them. So when I was a very little girl, I didn't go to school terribly often. I didn't wear shoes. I didn't speak English. And I spent my time living with hunting gatherers who were still hunting and gathering. So some of the weirdest things I have done, I did them when I was seven and eight years old. When I ate witchetty grubs and dug up snakes and killed them and got water out of frogs. And pretty much after that, Nothing has surprised me as much. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I just wanted to... I mean, to... every now and again, every now and again, I look around and think less in surprise and more in a kind of wonder. There are moments when I'm amazed this is where my life has ended up. I mean, you know, I'm a, a kid from a working class family. I come from an early, you know, one of the early divorced families of the 1970s. I think I was the first broken home on the block. Um, you know, I had a pretty feral childhood and there are days when I look around and I'm amazed. I mean, I'm talking to you now, which partly excuses all the noise for your listeners, I'm sorry, but I'm talking to you now from the lobby of a hotel in the financial district in Manhattan and I'm off to give a talk to some, you know, well-known industry people this afternoon and then I'll get on a plane and fly back to San Francisco. And on the one hand, that all sounds terribly glamorous. It mostly is and it just means you're slapping yourself through a lot of airports. Um, but on the other hand, it's a life I couldn't have imagined when I was eight years old. And I am less, I think, struck by the improbability of the things I have done and more by the entire arc of it, right? I've had an extraordinary existence up until now, and I, you know, I'm sort of grateful to all the pieces of good fortune and fate <laughs> that brought it my way. So mostly I don't marvel at the improbabilities of it. There are just moments when I look around and go, oh my God, how did I get here? <laughs> <laughs> and how did I manage to get to stay here? Because it's pretty damn cool. <laughs> <laughs> and Geneva, like mentioned the idea of like, you couldn't imagine like, like where you're going to end, um, yeah, end up. And I guess, of course, one part is your, mm, is due to your work, but a huge part, of, and it's the case for every one of us is like, we, can't really imagine where we're going to end up in a few years because technology is changing the way uh, we live so much. Yep. What, yep. Where, where are we heading right now? Like, what are the main trends that you see? Interesting. Well, sort of, actually, there's, there's something I want to kind of, there's two pieces of that for me, right? Is that I don't think we do know where we're going to end up, but I think most of us have a, a North Star or, or a, 
a thing that kind of propels us, right? An idea of what we want to do. And for me, I was really lucky, in addition to all the other things in my life, is that my mother was a, an amazing role model for me and always used to tell me when I was a kid and all the time I was growing up that you had a moral obligation to make a better world if you could see it. So while I don't know necessarily where I'm going personally, I know that the work I want to do has to fit that bill, right? It has to actively help make the world a better place. And I know we have a, a lot of work to do in that regard. Because when I look at the technologies that are coming and the futures that are unfolding, you know, in some ways they will be continuities from where we have been. There will continue to be more and more compute devices, you know, and they will kind of expand out from a world where we once had a desktop or a laptop and added a smartphone to it, to a world of connected things, right? Cars and watches and maybe home automation objects and things that look more like Nest and Alexa, so Google's products and Amazon's products that are also computers, but that don't necessarily have screens and keyboards in the ways we are used to. So we will have a world with an increasing amount of computation around us and on us. Um, we will inhabit worlds that are increasingly smart or connected in that way. And I think we will also move to a world where the data that is generated by those devices and by us and in dialogue with other devices is going to be more powerful than it has been. So whether that's about big data or the Internet of Things or a world of algorithms, I sometimes think I've spent the last 15 years looking at the intersection of people and devices, and we're moving into a time of thinking about people and devices, but also people and data and data and devices. And that's a more complicated landscape. It's a landscape where, and you can already see it in the headlines and stories around us now, it's a landscape in which conversations about privacy and security and trust, as well as identity and reputation and ideas about productivity and efficiency, as well as pleasure and happiness, are all thrown into a very different kind of stark relief. And so, you know, I can tell you, well, listen, you know, my good friends at, at, and colleagues at Cisco say 50 billion connected devices by the end of this decade. And that's a, a data point, but it doesn't tell you a great deal about what that's going to feel like. And the reality is we are going to inhabit that world with all those devices and all the data that it generates. And so for me, when I think about a future, I think about increasing levels of complexity, increasing levels of complexity, not just at a technical level, but at a social and a cultural level. Because in some ways, in many places in the world, we have barely caught up to what it means to live in a world of lots of devices, let alone a world of lots of connected data generating and consuming and algorithmizing, say that word, and you know the making of algorithms of those devices. So my sense is more complexity, but also the opportunity for new forms of many things. I mean, you know, there's new prospect for entertainment on the horizon with different kinds of screen technology from you know, augmented and virtual reality, which suggests we're going to have to think about narratives differently. So, you know, sort of more pervasive screen and connectivity technologies to fatter pipes and bandwidth, but also to questions about government regulation, about trade-offs between privacy and national security. And I can't think of a more exciting time to get to be a researcher in some ways. I think I think the last 15 years were kind of remarkable, but I suspect the next 15 are going to be even more interesting. So I just keep coming back to this. You've caught me on a day where I'm feeling particularly fortunate for the life I have had and the one I might get to have. It's probably to be what you want your want to want to hear, but it's a good time to be a researcher and a thinker and a human being. And that's true. And then you, you mentioned the idea of complexity and an increasing complexity. And as humans, we're always attracted by technology, like technology is something that we all find really appealing. But at the same time, it creates some anxiety. Uh, we'll also see an increasing fear of missing out. Everybody wants to be uh, at the top all the time. Like, How do you th see the relationship between human and computers fitting with this kind of paradoxical idea? Um, I think they become increasingly complicated um, because it's also the questions you will ask about which human being because age matters and race matters and gender matters and the body matters and who you are matters. Um, so my suspicion is there won't be one single relationship between humans and the world. It will in fact be like it is now, but more incredibly complicated. Um, and I think, you know, we 
are in this interesting moment where we are both citizens and consumers. And those are, or should they be? Um, and I think there are ways about what it will mean to be a citizen in a world of data as well as a consumer that are kind of up for grabs right now. Um, and my suspicion is that in some places, one of my suspicions is different everywhere, right, is that there will be very different unfoldings of these things. And you've already seen it in different regulatory frameworks. The U.S. thinks quite differently about data and privacy than they do in Europe. And none of those things are stable. So this is a kind of classic anthropologist's answer, right? Is uh, the world will be complicated, and that complexity is not easily resolved. And we, will we have to educate children about how to use technology correctly uh, regarding the privacy <laughs> concern and also like not being too immersed in the technology and also considering the real world? I'm not sure children are really thinking they need to educate them about that. <laughs> <laughs> Frankly, when you look at, you know, when you look at behavior, I'm always struck by the data that people like the guys at the Pew, Pew Internet, us in the United States, wonderful researchers, and who maintain longitudinal studies about people in tech. I mean, their data starts from chance that the cohort that is coming up that are currently, you know, 14 and under, are really, in the US at least, a little bit frustrated by their parents and so they are determined not to be locked. Um, you know, so I suspect what we are going to see is this constant, um, like we see with everything else, it's cyclical. I mean, there is a reason why vinyl is back after 20 years of digital music. Because, you know, a young generation looked at MP3 files and said, oh, God, that's so my parents. <laughs> you know, how can I get music differently? Oh, vinyl looks good. And, you know, the sale of vinyl records is up dramatically in the last two years, which is really kind of funny. So my suspicion is, sure, we should definitely teach kids in schools about digital literacy and about digital responsibility and citizenship. You know, we need to help them understand what their rights and responsibilities are and how to think about the longevity of that data and its consequences. But we need to have those same conversations with adults. And we need to have the same conversations about schooling and reskilling with baby boomers as we do with Gen X, Gen Y, and Gen Z. And I think one of the things we sometimes do is imagine just teach kids and all be okay. And the reality is we're all living in that world and for lots of people, some of them children, but some of them grown ups, there are big complicated questions about how you feel about stuff and how you navigate that world sort of carefully. And oh, by the way, it changes over time. So, you know, I think it's not that long ago that Mark Zuckerberg said the privacy genie was out of the bottle. But between the events of Snowden, Harris, Brussels, and, you know, ongoing court cases in the United States, it's quite clear that ideas about privacy are neither stable nor nor, uni, nor unilinear. They're not, you know, moving in one direction. They are, in fact, much more complicated. Even if we ask the question, what should we teach kids about technology? What would we be teaching them? Should we be teaching them programming languages and how to build things? Should we be teaching them about data and ways in which it moves and is constituted? Should we be teaching them about their roles and responsibilities as citizens in a data world? No, but I suspect it's not as simple as saying, teach children about technology because that solves the world. I think those are conversations that are actually lifelong. So true, so true. Genevieve, thank you so much for being here. I'm very considerate of your time. I just have a last question. Where can our listeners find more about your work? Um, so there's a couple of places. You can follow me on Twitter under the handle Feral Data, F-E-R-A-L-D-A-T-A. -A -A. Um, I'm reliably informed that almost every talk I've given in the last three years on YouTube, I refuse to go look, but people tell me they are there. <laughs> they are, they are. And then I have a book. <laughs> Yeah, that's what I'm afraid of. And then I have a book that I co-authored with a colleague of mine, Paul Dorish, called um, Divining, Divining a Digital Future in the Ubiquitous Computing, which was out from MIT Press a few years back. And then I am trying to work with, must say, precious little success on two new works, one of which I hope will come out in 2017 and then one probably the year after. So, you know, watch this spot. Awesome, Arthur. Awesome. Thank you very much, Genevieve. You're very welcome. Thank you for thank you for taking the time to talk to me. I appreciate it.